Welcome back to the Sea Mask Podcast. I'm here with my intrepid patriarchs, Will Noland, Mike Pantile, Timothy J. Gordon. And I'm quite excited to discuss the subject of tomboys. I never thought I would say that sentence. <laughs> but uh, about a week ago, there was a woman on Twitter named Samira who is a female journalist uh, and she quote tweeted a video of a woman named Hannah Barron, who I'm going to estimate is about 28 years old and said, I'll, I'll get the, the quote exact here. This accent needs to be illegal and women should be banned from doing manual labor like this. There's nothing feminine about American women. American women are literally men. And it's a video of this Hannah Baron walking around outside with a new construction behind her talking in a very, very deep Alabamanian accent. Uh, deep Southern accent. And the comments just exploded. It got 62, 63 million impressions. 16,000 quote tweets and retweets and tens of thousands of comments. And the comments were trashing the original woman who quote tweeted because this woman uses tremendous amounts of makeup. And it quite rapidly became sort of a who's hotter debate. Uh, people were saying that if you found the Southern girl, this tomboy, attractive, that you were gay. You found the uh, Kardashian-looking woman attractive. You were gay because she had to have been trans because of how much makeup and plastique she had on her face. And then more and more videos started coming to light of this Hannah Barron doing decently hard physical labor building houses, hauling PVC tubing uh, in the hot sun, uh, catfishing with her bare hands and, and all these things, all with this very deep Southern accent, but paradoxically with a, a quite attractive feminine physique, um, which, is, which is another point that I guess the the most polite way I could put this is that her Hannah Barron's social media profiles are, we'll just say, full of occasions of sin. Mm -hmm. um, she's married. She has a husband. From what I can tell, she has no children. And the comments that arose from this were things such as, you know, with the way that this country is going, thank God that there's girls who can do manual labor. We can still be girly girls and do manual labor. Tomboys are okay. Um, and so on and so forth. And so I threw my two cents in. And I said, hot or not, who cares? This is gender dysphoria. Ain't no way she has an iota of femininity. How many times is she going to try to outman you in every domain? Because of the years of LARPing. In manual labor, her mom and dad failed her. So I just want to get opening shots uh, as this came across y'all's timeline. What were your reactions and your reactions to the comments? We'll love to start with you. So I saw it start. I didn't really follow the comments, though, because I could see it was just descending into a big argument between lots of women so I just carried on with my normal work and didn't really engage with it. But I did think it was interesting that this had blown up. It was obviously a real soft spot. And I think it's another one of those examples where people are more feminist than they actually realize, especially the, of, of the women who think they're anti-feminist. They're kind of not. So that's why I see it as a sign of, in a nutshell. Yeah, Mike, how about you? What did you, what did you see? I wasn't, I'm you not up? surprised to see how much, you know, Western civilization is degraded to the point where we're defending uh, masculine women. And it's, it's disappointing because she's, she's attractive and she could, she should, she could probably be a good wife and a mother, but can you, can you imagine the pain in the ass 
that she is to her husband. And so when you see these comments from people in which I actually respect saying that she's pure Americana and I'm not American, um, but I'm willing to say that that's not Americana. It's just a sign of the overarching gender dysphoria that has infected um, American culture where feminine women are defending a very much masculine, masculine woman. And also to, as a, as a, as a Christian, having my feed filled with, you know, uh, you know, you just said occasions of sin where men could potentially stumble. It's so amazing how, um, to see the lack of self-awareness from other believing folks, just spreading this like an infection across uh, social media. So those are my, those are my initial, initial thoughts. It's also kind of ridiculous how this is all blown up, but I guess that's the society we live in. Yeah, it is. And Tim, I saw you had a, a tweet, I don't know, 20 minutes ago about gender dysphoria, just in case it's not at the tip of your tongue. I'll read what you said as a springboard for you. Gender dysphoria means, even according to the DSM-5, a man who acts like a woman in primary or secondary characteristics, not just primary. And then you challenge women and the world and the left. Would you say the same thing in reverse? Yeah, of course. That's that's the funny part about feminism, which is the original gender dysphoria. Conservatives are willing to say about men who assume primary or secondary sex characteristics of women that they're at the very least engaging in cultural appropriation and at the very least in 2013 when dsm-5 was published they're engaging in gender dysphoria they're not willing to say this about women who act like men and here's how i know because tomboy which even gives away the ghost both tom and boy are boy things i think conservatives are like no this is this is really good it's a conservative principle i'll never forget a relative of mine was like i want my daughter to not be a cheerleader but to play her own sport and i would just say this is gender dysphoric um sports are training for war going to war is a primary male characteristic this is not open to debate well, yeah, I want to figure out what a tomboy is. I think we can circumscribe it. We'll either circumscribe the definition by talking about it and around it, and then it'll be obvious, or um, we'll find out that there isn't such thing as a tomboy, that it's somewhat of a simulacrum here. And tomboy just means woman with bad dad basically at the end of the day um but i'm curious if you guys think maybe well i'll bounce this back to you for starters do you guys think that there are inherently masculine or inherently feminine behaviors hobbies practices proclivities or is there a like a very large um gradient and then only at the extremes do you find like ah well powerlifting and war on one side and then like birthing a literal human so i want to get into that by looking at what aristotle says first because it's always good to start with just a mega brain like that as the basis for the discussion but before I do that, I just want to say before I forget, I think part of the tomboy phenomenon might actually be something to do with the amount of testosterone that the baby girl is exposed to in the womb. I do think you do get girls who do have better than average aptitude at the stereotypically male tasks. It doesn't mean that they're going to be attracted to women or anything like that. It just means that they're better than usual for a girl at things that boys are normally good at. And it takes them a while to actually work through that because kids like getting praised for stuff that they're good at. 
and they just have a bit of confusion early on in life, I think, in their peer group at school. But that links to your second point, which is, are there tasks that we expect men to do and that we expect women to do? And is that based on natural law? Have we got a physiological basis for it as well? Just from a purely secular perspective, what do we know about biology? Yeah, for sure. I think we do. And Aristotle writes this in his economics. The nature of both partners, man and woman, has been prearranged by a divine dispensation in view of their partnership, for they differ by not having their faculties available all to the same effect, but some even to opposite effects, though combining to a common end. For God made the one sex stronger and the other weaker, that the one for fear may be the more careful. And we know that anxiety is a lot more common in women. They're generally more afraid of the world because they're always worried about what dangers it might be for uh, the baby in particular. So women tend to be um, higher in trait anxiety than men are. So we've got the one for fear may be the more careful and the other for courage, the more capable of self-defense. That's the man's role as a protector, right? And then we've also got, and that the one may forage abroad, that's the man, while the other, shock, horror, keeps house. And for work, the one is made competent by sedentary employments, but too delicate for an outdoor life, while the other makes a poor figure at keeping still. Just think about how many little boys are diagnosed with ADHD and medicated in school because they've been asked to just sit through an education system that is tailored to what it's like for a girl to learn. Sit still, hand up, yes, miss, no, miss, not much activity. Most boys hate that. So the other makes a poor figure at keeping still, but it's vigorous and robust in movement. And touching children, the generation is special, but the improvement of the children is the joint labor of both parents, for it belongs to the one to nurture, to the other to chastise. So not only in terms of providing for the family and protecting the family, but even in the rearing of children, Aristotle is marking out specifically male and female areas of competence. And the point is that they are complementary. So that's a lot for me. I'll stop talking now. But I think he's covered a lot in that. Yeah, I think the world will have you believe that there's no such thing as masculine or feminine activities, but those of us that have a, an actual brain, a functioning brain and, and spirit knows that's not the case. I mean, look no further than let's say a, a woman that's engaged in, in a hobby that's traditionally masculine, say lifting weights. If it's not well, well ordered, it can certainly be okay for her, but if it's not well ordered and she doesn't have it under control, that woman becomes quickly masculine. And I, I would even venture to say that there are certain activities that women shouldn't engage with at all. Uh, in particular, mixed martial arts, martial arts in general. You know, the world would say, oh, yeah, it's self-defense. There's nothing a 130-pound woman, 120-pound woman can do to a man that wants to impose his will upon her. And so what do we <laughs> – I think we talked about this too. I think this is a previous C-mask where um, women in blood sport is a sign of cultural decline, obviously, right? We're talking about Joe Rogan's ridiculous reaction to when a woman gets knocked out or whatever. But then on the flip side, for a man, what do we see – Will, you and I work with a lot of uh, married couples with a man that's at home and a woman that out earns him or just he, he doesn't earn and she earns. What happens to them? Their roles become inverted. He becomes emasculated. One could even say there's probably on a biological level, he's probably producing more estrogen. There's no he's not imposing his will on the world at all. He's at home doing these feminine um, activities and his wife is earning money and it masculinizes her. And so you have this case with this woman, which is, you said her name is Hannah or whatever. Um, all of these masculine activities have been like imprinted and projected upon her, which is completely like eroded at her femininity. And so a lot of people would say that we're these vicious misogynists when really, if you take a deeper look and you're able to kind of get through the noise and the emotionality of it, we want to preserve femininity. There's three of us here that have daughters. We point this out and say, hey, this is, this is, this is bullshit because we see a woman that's acting like a man. I don't want my daughters to act like a man. So this is why, you know, for all of these reasons, this is just, it's just disorderly. Yeah. 
Tim, do you want to speak a bit to the absconding father in this situation? You know, Mike set this up that these masculine tropes are imposed on the woman. Um, from whom? Sure. Um, let me cue it up a little bit first. Th this is scientific, the way conservatives and liberals alike who, who care about being like politically correct, care about science. We have measures for this stuff. When I found out that long distance running is estrogenic and you, you, you start increasing estrogen in your body as a male, if you run longer than 25 minutes, I stopped running longer than 25 minutes. I, I, I literally did. I, 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 I'm a marathon runner. I've run marathons. I don't do that anymore. I, I mean, I ran one, but I would would continue to long distance train, and I've considered doing another many times until I saw the the data seven or eight years ago. It makes a difference if you're a person who cares about facts, right? Aren't they supposed to not care about our feelings or something like that? Don't conservatives believe that? Well, any behaviors that increase testosterone are bad for women, just as behaviors which increase uh, estrogen are bad for men. And so, yeah, I probably have a stricter conditional uh, um, grasp of what's bad for men and women. And the surprising thing is that in 2013, DSM-5 agreed with me, not just primary sex characteristics, but secondary ones. And if you want to say that going to war is a secondary one and in sports or something like that, weightlifting doesn't count as secondary. Well, it's at the very least tertiary. So, and, and that, that, I'm sure would be thrown in prior to 2014, 2015, 2016, Bruce Jenner. Anyway, they, they meant all of them. When you're, when you're at the point when you're saying primary and, and secondary, you mean primary, secondary, tertiary, quaternary, all of these, all confusion that's downstream of primary characteristics should not be engaged with. We're radically different. There is a radical otherness, as Emmanuel Levinas says. Of course, this almost always means behaviors. And I just don't understand conservatives that, remember, were mad at me and that megha about Diapergate from early last summer. They're like, gender dysphoria is not about the behaviors accomplished by men or women. Um, yes, it is. So, OK, so you're willing to say that men can wear dresses. I mean, it's not wrong if I go put on in my own closet, in my own wife's closet, throw on her dress for 30 seconds and take it off. I haven't I haven't committed a mullum in say, but it is really wrong if I wear that thing out, even for five minutes or even if I even if I get into doing that five minutes a day, I'm becoming dysphoric. So it's just a behavior. It's all, all it really is, is these primary and secondary sex characteristics. They're just behaviors and conservatives conservatives have reified like a like a, a thick difference between primary and, and secondary character, characteristics in their own head conclusorily but then you point out all this stuff aside from going and getting surgery the the, the change operation surgery all of them are just behaviors and generally speaking Yes, men should not engage in female endeavors and females shouldn't in, engage in male endeavors. And I would just say this prior, previous to, to actually putting the cap on with your answer. Like, in addition to testosterone or estrogen building, the main mark of femininity is availability. Like, men want women that are available. You don't want to have to pencil in one date with a female because she's so busy. She's got all these meats. I've got a weightlifting meat. I've got a golf meat. I've got, I don't care if they're slightly more girly sports. She's supposed to be cheering you on. She's supposed to be, you know, okay, that's cool. If you're a cheerleader, then we travel to the boys basketball game together because I'm playing in it. You're cheering for it. There's nothing more Americana than that right? Head football player, the point guard of the basketball team, dating the head cheerleader. That's Americana. You can't just change this. And, I mean, they, they changed it because now America's gender dysphoric, but conservatives who want to characterize the way we never were 
oh, the, the boy's the captain of the wrestling team. The girl is the captain of the girls' wrestling team. They go together. See, that that's not right. And it's conservative men, to answer your question now, who have failed their daughters in precisely the way you're insinuating, Nick, by giving them, by passing on, not genetically and not even generationally because it's a brand new thing, this gender dysphoria. Saying like, oh, it's, it's, it's always slutty to be a cheerleader. I want you to just engage and become a man. How about be a cheerleader and don't be slutty? That's what conservative men should be passing on to their daughters. And that's cool that this Hannah Barron spends lots of time with her dad. It shouldn't be painting his fingernails so he is like a girl or him bringing her to the construction site so that she's a dude should be he goes to work. Let's imagine a Transformers 4 kind of dad-daughter relationship. Maybe there's not a mom in the picture. I don't know. He goes to work. Maybe she takes on some of the extra feminine motherly duties at home, in my imagination. This is the ideal situation. And then when they get home, they commune together as a father and a daughter should. And she's cooked for him. He tells her about his day, what the, the things that a, a daughter are doing. When you, when you leave out the romance, aren't that different from the mother because the mother's supposed to be training the daughter. And so note how in this whole equation, final comment, Hannah Barron, no one talked about the healthy relationship between Hannah Barron and her mother. And I know that might be because I, I, don't, I haven't looked into it that much. It might be because she passed on. God reposed her soul. God bless the little family. But that's the problem. That's where the gender dysphoria came in. Either the mom wasn't around or the mom's mentally or emotionally absent. People love this kind of ding on, on YouTube just because I, I, don't, I don't give a shit about these, the particulars of these situations. Or maybe she died. But the point is she's become gender dysphoric because she's not having a mom showing her the home economy. Oh, economy. And that's, that's where we should also make note here. Home economy matters. Yeah, do you guys know that um, statue called the the Venus of Willendorf? It's like the first um, artwork, one of the earliest works of art, and the first symbol of womanhood. Have you seen that online? It's just a really fat woman with massive breasts and belly wearing a basket <laughs> hat, and there's no other representation of a uh, a human like carved like that. It's the first one ever. Mm. I think it's like. Um, Oh, oh yeah, I've seen that? this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's just standing there, and she's just like huge for some reason. Yeah, I, she's probably just either um, about to give birth or something like that, or it's just an exaggerated vision of what they associated with womanhood. And it comes before any representations of men. And basically, it's got two things. So naked, apart from the fact that you're wearing a, a woven basket hat, and it really tells you what the early humans, this must be like 30,000 years old roughly, um, thought about what a woman was. And you've got pregnancy and breastfeeding and the woven basket hat. And the the woven hat is to do with the fact that the women were basically around camp the whole time, just doing these small domesticated chores. They didn't picture her with like a, a bow and arrow or a spear out hunting. And that's connected to the breasts, right? Do you know what percentage water breast milk is? It's super interesting. It's about 88% water. And that means that to actually sustain a baby on it, because it's not very nutrient dense, the woman has to have the baby with it the whole time. And people forget that the actual breastfeeding went on in hunter-gatherer societies up to about age four. So the idea that she's just out the whole time doing man jobs with the baby hanging off her breast until age four is crazy. The core of being a woman is about nurturing. And the extra tasks they did around camp, like making the, the nets, uh, the baskets later on with the like the ceramic pots to store grain in. These are all things just backing up the men, minor domestic chores. They're not actually out there doing the same things as the men. This brings up a, a very key aspect of this, which is the should. We're saying that there are masculine and feminine behaviors and tasks and that men should do the masculine ones. The women should do the feminine ones and should's got a lot of weight. And I could see somebody responding to this and say, okay, but it's not 30,000 years ago. A woman can go work for DoorDash or become a CEO or do OnlyFans, pay cash for a house and doesn't need you anymore. So in an age of abundance, 
why should she keep doing what she's doing? Well, or what she's supposed to do. For one thing, our biology hasn't changed since the Stone Age. Human nature is not malleable like that. It's still the same as it always was. And if we come back to Mike's example of the guy whose wife earns more than he does, and maybe he's going to decide to be a household, um, a house husband because it's the 21st century, bro. Why not? Well, that's very highly correlated with impotency. Just is. It's very highly correlated with the man becoming impotent because the way he sees himself, the way his wife sees him, neither of them finds this situation sexy. So the biology is saying, you made a mistake here. Isn't it higher? Hey. Uh, there's higher incidences of infidelity as well. Yeah, and divorce. A woman, a woman cannot be attracted to that kind of man. That's biological. So you can change all these like societal external factors, sure. And then not to mention if you you did an actual honest, not to mention, I don't think these any of these career women would be honest, but isn't overall like satisfaction for women at like an all-time low? You see all these TikToks going viral, these women in their 30s and 40s saying that they've been uh they 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 bought a lie and now they want children, they don't want the career. Okay, well, sure, go do the man stuff. You're gonna end up just another one of these examples of these feminists. Uh, uh, chicks with a bunch of cats in the home. Tell me how much you can change biology. You can't. It's, it's, it's not a conservative idea. A any of the, what Tim described as cuckservatives who are saying that these shoulds don't matter. You are committed to the liberal delusion of infinite progress where we can just make ourselves into whatever we want to be as long as we change society. But that's not the way it is. The reality is that it's exactly as Aristotle outlined a couple of thousand years ago, and it's always going to be that way. Well, isn't it and Michael Malice that had this quote that we can all agree with, regardless of our opinion of him, is that conservatism is just liberalism going the speed limit? Yeah. Yeah, well, unless you reject the Hegelian dialectic of history in the first place, which a conservative really should. The phenomenology of Geist, the Aufhebung, which is the idea of history moving forward in terms of this triad triad you know a position a negation and a higher third position that's how the left moved forward on on a hegelian basis and guess what that's how as you guys are pointing out beautifully here that's how the right moves forward is on this basis of a hegelian view of history whereby it suffices ipse dixit to just go it's not 30,000 years ago, bro. You know what they could have said 30,000 years ago? They could have gone relative to our time. It's not 60,000 years ago, bro. You could always say that. You could always say, oh, hey, this is 1990. In 1980, they could have said, this is 1980. Well, we, that's not very 80s behavior. They could say 1970. That's not very 1970s behavior. And they did say that. That's what, that's what progressive conservatives and liberals have said every new decade that's not very 90s behavior bro and the <laughs> fact of the matter is that we as christians it's not even just because we're catholic christians are supposed to have a an idea fise, a fixed idea of human nature and nature the way that we relate to it it could be the year twenty thousand. men and women are still precisely what they are and i i just want to i want to typify something that i said last comment that's relevant to this one it's not just about the science, estrogen and testosterone. It's really, really woven into human nature, into polarity that like, like a couple of magnets, a positive with a negative. Men are activity-based. Women are passivity-based. Men are expressive. Women are receptive. Do I need to give like a sixth grade human sexuality course? Men are expressive. <laughs> women are receptive. When you start saying women can be really active and really, really expressive as principles of, of human nature as well, gender dysphoria. And, and also, there will be an opportunity cost in satisfaction. I think A.J. Barker said something to me and Nick yesterday, like, going forward blindly, you will always have the tell of human suffering. Men and women are both dissatisfied because men want attention from women. Women want attention from men. And if women are getting involved in all these male activities, even if they're seen as wholesome, if done on a weekend getaway with Hannah's father one time per year, they go fishing. Cool. If it's 
Hey, I'm making this a habit. This is me. I'm the best. I, I join in fishing competitions. I join in weightlifting competitions. I join in home building. I, I, I build homes for a living. That's dysphoric. And there's going to be an opportunity cost in her man, her husband's satisfaction because we time's a scarce resource and her attention is a scarce resource. Men want the attention from women just as women want it from men. And when you say, don't be a cheerleader, play your own sport. You're saying take away time and attention from men. That's most basic. So like we've done a lot of work. I've done a lot of work in case for patriarchy on the research of Wolf, Wolfer and Stevenson, who said women are getting more and more unhappy and dissatisfied by every five years when they check because they're in the workplace. But also men are because women are acting more like dudes. That means there's a scare, a, a greater scarcity than even 50 years ago of time, female time and attention. Machiavelli called this availability. Mm. Yeah. yeah, the the space for each other, which is the ultimate point of this particular episode that I, I do want to get to is, is the idea of romance. And you're starting to circumscribe that, Tim, that availability. How are you supposed to fall in love if you don't have the time and, and attention for each other? Um, and we're, we're discussing these shoulds. And I'm, I appreciate that you guys were able to express that they're not tr transient. It's not relativism to say that, well, you should behave a certain way depending on the decade that you find yourself in that's nonsense this stuff is written on the human heart um and it's also encoded in your genetics and it reminds me of uh, the line that jeff goldblum says in jurassic park one your scientists were so preoccupied with whether or not they could they didn't stop to think if they should and that brings up a point here that for some reason, the world today and the feminists within it are under the impression that for us to be correct here on this podcast, the four of us to be correct about nature, they think that things that are counter nature must be impossible. So, oh, you're saying that women shouldn't do this, that this is counter natural. Then how come I'm able to do this? It's not what we're saying. We aren't saying that the, the counter natural is impossible. Murder is possible. Pederasty, homosexuality, theft. These are all counter natural and they're all possible and they happen all the time. We're saying that if you engage in that, only misery and suffering will follow. Will, will yeah, you look like you're about to say something? Well, I was just going to say that there was that case. I've forgotten her name. I, I remember the numbers, but not her name. There was a woman in the U.S. Army who really wanted to go and prove that she could do what the men do on the front lines in Afghan. And she got her squat up into, I think it was like the low 300s for reps, which is, you know, some guys can't do that decently strong, isn't it, Mike, for a woman? And she was so carrying sure. the backpack and she was digging the trenches all day. And in the end... Uh, her body started breaking down a lot faster than the men. She couldn't figure it out. And then her period stopped and she kept getting sick, getting infections as well. And then she came back and said, I don't think it's a good idea for women to go and do the same jobs as those guys. I did it for a bit, but the toll that it took on my body showed that I wasn't really meant to be doing that. Look up her story. It's super interesting. And in China, during the Great Leap Forward, when they tried to get women doing all the work with the uh, iron in the like the backyard furnaces, um, it didn't work out well. The women kept getting sick as well. When they tried to put women into manual labor with the mining too, they kept getting urinary tract infections because women are much more susceptible to like dirt and grime than men are. So mm -hmm. you can make them do it, but it's not good for them and it's not good for society. So that idea that it's encoded into genetics and coming back to what Aristotle said about the two sexes being complementary and there being things that each are built for is so true. And you can look at this without even having to go out into the field to test it out. You can just figure out in a lab. So super interesting stats like men are much better at throwing and catching than women are. 
Even little kids know this. Like you throw like a girl, they can see it. And this is because men are better at handing projectiles, like the spear, whatever it is, the hand-eye coordination for the hunting task that men did. We've also got by age three, that's super evident. And it's to do with testosterone. One of my favorite facts is that um, homosexual men aren't much better at throwing than women are because they tend to be deficient in testosterone. Doesn't mean it's natural for them to be homosexual. It just means they've got a defect. And then men are better at um, movements in external space, but women are much better at coordinating movements within personal space. Now, an argument for that is that um, I can think of far more guys I've heard of who've accidentally dropped a baby because they're just being a klutz in personal space movements than women. It's very rare to hear about a mom who's dropped her own kid, but I've heard mm-hmm. stories about a dad like just walking around, oh, I dropped my baby on his head uh, <laughs> b- because the personal space movements are not his forte. So it's better to let the mom be multitasking and carrying the baby. Um, w- women have like a lower threshold for detecting sound as well. They can hear a baby crying much better than a man can. Anyone who's had kids knows this. Like at nighttime, the mom will wake up much faster than the guy will. So right. there's reasons for all of this stuff. Also, I would just say, I, I'm always banging my elbows on shit around the house, banging my head, like turning around. I mean, you know, six one, two hundred pounds. It's just less easy to move around the kitchen island or turn corners. Steph's never banging her head or her elbows on stuff moving around the house. Also, um, you know, just trying to go backwards in time from all of Will's points. The movie The Sandlot. Classic, classic American film came out, I think, 1991. You you know, you play ball like a girl is the biggest insult after a whole litany of insults traded between, you know, the the good guy Sandlot kid on the team (laughs) and guys and everyone's jaw drops. Well, when they came out with some lame sequel to this 12 years later, I think it's 03, 04. There was there's like two or three girls on the team, whereas in the Sandlot, there are nine guys on a nine man baseball team. And you play ball like a girl's most famous line in the movie, many famous lines in the movie, but that's the most famous one. 12 years later, they're, they, they got to get the token, token girls on the team and two or three of them. And they say to each other, like you play ball, like a boy, a kind of humiliation ritual, a, a sorry for acknowledging nature earlier. Um, my point in bringing this up is what was going on in the nineties? Remember, I thought I thought second wave feminism was the, you know, 1970. Something about third wave feminism, just the natural development in the life of feminism. It was always the same genetically what it was going to be. But by the time you get to third wave feminism in the 90s, that's what changed it, where it was actually much more adversarial. Less women are calling themselves feminist, but the host is absorbing the, the bug of feminism much more, even as through the 80s and 90s, far fewer women identified as a feminist. But you can see they're advancing the agenda more and more, even amongst a population of people that deny that they're feminists, which is why, you know, by the time you get to the time I I got married in 2005, these sequels had come out and they were saying, I'm sorry for saying that boys should do boy things like baseball and girls should do girl things like staying and learn to cook and clean, uh, you know, which is what they used to teach even after 1970 and second wave feminism, I think it was really third wave feminism that that is hitting us with the more obviously dysphoric stuff. Also, book five of Aristotle, he's not talking about men and women, but here it's considered the birthplace of treatise form natural law. Anyway, book five of Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics, he makes the point time and again that when he says, oh, nature is the measure of whether or not an action is inherently good or bad for a thing to be what it is, the the function argument. He doesn't mean that as among humans, as Nick pointed out, capacity bequeaths the wrongness or rightness of an action. It's whether it's a naturally adequated desire to, to, to satisfy a capacity. That's the question. That's it. It doesn't mean that all, If I can commit murder, if my hand can physically grasp a knife like this and do that to somebody's neck, it must be right. That's a putrid, appalling, childish understanding of Aristotle. It's someone that's not even trying to understand Aristotle. Same thing. Do these conservatives think who are defending this Hannah Berenchik 
that if I try to put on a dress, if it's naturally wrong, according to the natural law, it will be like a force field and it will bounce off my body and fly across the room. That's not how Aristotelian or Thomist morality works. Like, like Nick said, you can rob a bank. It's wrong to do and you're going to go to jail. It's like God didn't make nature, even though that's an unnatural thing to do. If you understand Aristotle, you have the capacity to do that. You're going to suffer for it. And that's what's happening in society now. We're suffering, not because liberals or radicals push this shit, because conservatives suck. If half of society was pushing and the other half was pushing back and, and we're winning a tug of war, I guess that would be polling. No one would be miserable aside from the radicals. Society sucks because conservatives suck. By definition. Go yeah, we're we're miserable over here. It's impossible to find a young woman who doesn't rebel against everything that we're saying and will make your life miserable as a young guy for saying it. And I'm, you know, Will and Mike, you guys actually work with older married guys who are going through that same thing. 100%. You know, it's funny, I guess, is my background in being a, a coach in the fitness space for over 10 years. When I saw this Hannah Barron chick, I saw her and I said, does this woman have fertility issues? Because yeah. what happens to a woman whose body fat levels get low, they run into fertility issues, hormonal issues. I have a lot of female clients that come to me and say, um, hey, Mike, I want a six pack. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. And it's another perfect example of, 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 of you know, there you go. Women in nature. We're not meant to do that. Men can do that. We can withstand having very, very low body fat levels because of testosterone, but their hormonal milieu is just not is not built for it. So I look at her. I'm like, okay, this woman's not just like speaking in a masculine way, but she, she's got a feminine figure. I'm not gonna say she looks like a man. She looks she looks good. She's in shape. But then I start to wonder, I'm like, is your eating also disordered? Because there's something very unattractive about a woman that wants to stay ultra low body fat and she just scrupulously just weighs everything and puts it into an app. It's like, listen. That's not feminine behavior. If my wife was like that, I'd call her out on that 1000%. And she knows that too. Anyway, it's not a huge point, but that's something the first thing that came to my mind. I'm like, can this woman even have a baby comfortably or safely? I'm sure. Get not. some fat on her. Yeah. <laughs> the, um, the only thing that's pushing back right now is actually nature itself. And once you get to that point, things get pretty bad because nature pushes back very hard over a long enough time period. And if you keep trying to make the fantasy run, if you won't give up on it, then eventually it has to get wrecked by reality. If people won't quit beforehand, this is like what happened with the attempts at socialist societies. Whenever you try to revolt like this and go that deep in the grain against human nature, then your delusions have to be left to play out. And that's what will happen with conservatism. I don't know how much worse it will have to get before people actually realize, but you can't win in the long run. Yeah. I, Ayn Rand has a quote that you can avoid reality, but you cannot avoid the consequences of avoiding reality. And we will run face first into that. But on a, I, I don't care as much about society at large as I do about the individual families and relationships, just because like, I, I don't have the capacity to care about, 350 million people in the United States or the duty to or the duty to. Yeah. That's another good point as well. I care about the individuals and individual romantic relationships. And so, uh, all right, I'll get to, I'll get to that in a second. There's a, f a few things I wanted to hit before I got into the romance subject and polarity, but before I got there, let's talk for a second about, why there's such friction in bringing forth these ideas. So Megha, the same um, woman on Twitter who uh, Tim quote tweeted a while back and it became the infamous diaper gate. Turns out she's actually quite brilliant. I've been reading through her tweets and been very impressed with what she said so far. And she had a wonderful tweet that said, peak feminism is believing that a woman can't be valuable unless she is useful in the same way that a man is. I thought that was very choice words because she's saying that, as, that the primary value proposition of a woman is not 
being of use, which is true. That's the primary value proposition of a man is being of use. But the counter to what she's saying is for some reason, it's the belief that what's in accordance to a woman's nature is belittling to her unless men are forced to do it too. Changing diapers, doing the dishes, cleaning the house. What is going on here that women, when acting in accordance with their nature, are convinced that it's because they're being degraded? Because it's the helpmate tasks. It's all the ones that involve being the cheerleader and the supporting role for the man as he goes about his way in the world. So when I'm helping married guys to actually restore the polarity in the relationship that's become disordered, then just getting them to do little things like give commands to the wife, like make me a drink, get my shirt ready for my work day tomorrow, make me X, Y, Z for lunch and just start small like that. And then make sure the wife is feeling praised and valued for doing all those things. Because if you can't get those little things right, you're not going to be able to have a well-ordered marriage where she truly is the helpmate in all areas. But feminism despises that. The only way they can tolerate that is if what you just described, Will, the only way that they can tolerate that is if they fetishize it. If they say, oh, that's a that's a kink. That's a fetish. That's 50 shades of gray. You're serving the man. And that doesn't play out well over the long term because it gets old, it wears off. To truly believe that what you're doing is like the core of your nurturing role in the household and it's valuable. That's the aim because that's what sustains a marriage over decades. So you know, let's what's amazing somebody... about... Go, go ahead. Sorry, no, go, go ahead. ahead, Nick. I was um, just going to say, it, it, what, what's, what's amazing about being in a well-ordered marriage is that when I'm at home, I don't have to think about where anything is ever at any time. I come here and it's like my place of comfort. Everything is where it should be. And when I take something and I use it, it's always replaced. And so we talk about this helpmate thing. I'm like, man, praise God for good wives. Cause like when I'm at home, I'm just, my head doesn't even have to be screwed on my body. <laughs> I, I take care of yeah. everything outside and everything inside is contained and it's beautiful and it's well-ordered. But man, like this, this thing comes down to, cause it's an interesting double speak that Meg or whatever. She's single, right? She has to be. No, that no she's, 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 she's married. married. I, I interviewed her for like an hour and a half a couple of years ago because I thought she was interesting. And um, she's she's smart. Um, but yeah, she's married and she runs her own business, her writing business from home. And she's an influencer. So we know what that means in terms of the remaining streak of feminism. But yeah, she, she's good at bringing up topics like this that get people talking for sure. But on the other hand, she, she says that it's belittling to a woman to engage in feminine behaviors. Did I understand that correctly? No, no. She's saying that it's not. And that's oh sorry I miss I misunderstood that's my bad no I'm not okay. gonna go on that tangent then that's totally my misunderstanding <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> so she's no got to be single with that kind of double speak but no I no you back. would expect and that's what was so pleasantly surprising is uh, she actually came to my aid uh, digitally on this um, this question of Hannah Barron when I quote tweeted uh, and yeah for some reason. Your three wives and Megha, I hope, I don't know how to pronounce her name. I think it's some Middle Eastern thing, like Megan. Megha and your wives don't find the feminine tasks belittling. They delight in them. It's not degrading to them. Tim, I'm curious, what do you think is constitutionally dispositionally different between the four women and the rest of the screaming harpies? Nothing constitutionally, uh, because the screaming harpies are women and they're built to do that. It's just habit. It's habitus. There's nothing more. Nothing more, nothing less than old-fashioned Aristotelian habit. And if you want to tell Aristotle a joke, you call it, oh, that's only a function of habit. He's like, well, habit's life, you know, a virtue um, a single act isn't a virtue. A virtue has to be a hab habituated action. And it's, it grows into your character when it's a habituated action. When something becomes your second nature, this is your character. And character is destiny. But, but character, character repeated is destiny. And action repeated is habit. And habit constitutes what, what is uh, virtue. So 
all of our wives grew up in the same because everyone's about the same age here. We're talking about people between 30 and 40 and that all of our wives grew up in the same toxic water as all these other ladies. It was just, it was, I was talking yesterday to um, one of the workmen at the house. Nick, I, I think you were talking to him too when we were outside playing basketball. He was like, that's cool. Cause yesterday was my birthday. He was like, Oh, that's cool. It's my um, 10 year anniversary. He, he, he brought up with me. He was like, man, the first two, three, four years of marriage, it was like a battle, but now it's smooth. And I, I didn't get into it. What exactly what he meant with him, but I think he meant if you do marriage, right. The first year or two should be about establishing ground. I think you could do it quicker than three or four years if you're really direct, but you just say, look, before you're a young woman, you kind of stood up for yourself. Most young women in this society go to college rather than be at their dads. And most of their dads probably weren't raising them right, even if they, they live with their dad right until their wedding day anyway. Meaning that all young wives are going to have to habituate. Um, oh, I'm a help me. I need to be, I am here to help. Which was my friend Joe's Twitter handle. That's funny. I'm here to help. That's my role. My role is secondary. The husband's role is primary. I'm here to do whatever he needs. And I should try to do that without him having to ask. That is the sign of real maturity. But if he asks, I should do it enthusiastically and happily. It's funny because some women that came out of this culture that are anti-feminist probably find it more natural to just do this stuff without being asked than to do it upon being asked. But the point is it's, it's nothing constitutional. It's, it's all about habituated learned virtue. And too many guys, I think nowadays as a sign of the effeminacy that's infected men don't want to put that work in, in the early stages of the marriage or during courtship, they'll say it's a red flag. Whereas actually it's something you can work through. If mm -hmm. you're dreaming yep. of just having this zero friction, perfect transition from the two of you being single to her being your help me, you're insane. And you're going to die single and miserable and bitter crying about modern women on Twitter. There, you, there are countless guys that you could have paired up with Steph and it would not have worked. Yep. Like you might think that, oh, if only I, I could find Steph, then I'd be like Tim. No, you wouldn't. That's true. That's true. That's so yeah. true. Maybe we need to say that more. <laughs> I'm, I'm just that realizing. Needs to be mentioned what, what, more. Yeah, that definitely needs to be mentioned more, Tim, because a lot of these guys have these like trad fantasies where you just kind of like skip off on your acreage and she's in her dress and she's dressed like a hobbit baking sourdough. It's like, yes, yes, sire. No problem. It's like, come on, man. That is absolutely about establishing ground. And you know what? Like in a way, like you should be tested as a man to a degree as well. Not that a woman should be unpleasant and, and shit testing you constantly, but you guys are yoked together for the entirety of your life. How is she going to establish any sense of safety if she can't trust you as a man to take care of your shit? Well, I, I think the entirety of feminism, I've said this before, is the greatest, longest lasting shit test since for the sure. creation of man, you know, and the fall of Adam and Eve. Because going back to the point of that which is unnatural is possible. We can violate nature as much as we want. I think women are going to leverage that unconsciously. They're going to leverage that to shit test men in the patriarchy in general until they find bedrock. And they're going to keep testing and testing and testing until one guy goes, Haha, no. And they're like, oh, Who's that guy? Oh, that's oh, that's Tim. Oh, that's Will. Oh, that's Mike. Wow, there's there is a backstop to this, and it's right here. And then they're gonna fight a little bit, and eventually from there, you can build on. Do you guys agree? Every feminist is one strong man away from being a trad wife. See, that's another way in which we're completely different than the red pill and the MGTOW. Uh, I almost said a, a mean word, Fel <laughs> fellows. <laughs> Mike, you have those one-liners. That's exactly the answer to how do you differentiate us in in red pill or MGTOW? That you with these killer one-liners, like every feminist is one strong man away from being a 
traditionalist that's absolutely unique to us and we're just saying it that we're doing our best to be aristotelians just to be philosophers of nature that's that's what it is man they don't want and same thing people get people get pissed at me i mean you see the great american noble american south all behind and around me here here in mississippi like i came here because this is the the, the greatest remnant wow. of americana um it's it's absolutely true people were throwing around what what is americana is it's you know this is it that is it women playing softball it's like no it's it's the stuff we're describing but we, we have we are equipped we seem to be equipped here on this cmas podcast week in week out episode in episode out of of doing an apt job of describing the basics and it, it's i don't feel like we're being challenged that much but in one way the one way is that society conservatives i'm not even talking about the left society's come so far that even conservatives when they're trying to get back to zero they just want to go a few notches to the right of where the left is and like this is this is what it's all about man it's just bringing conservatives back to the true space oh that this is the other thing that that everyone got mad at me about when i was like look in my view particularly most of the red states what's good about them is fallen Christianity. Uh, it tends to be Protestantism. So young Catholic guys, go convert a Protestant girl. They, they didn't like, the Catholics didn't like when I said that. I'm like, Catholic girls are more for, for historical and um, historic contingent reasons. Catholic girls are more messed up and more susceptible to feminism. So go find yourself a conservative girl. And people reacted the exact same way to me as how they are probably in the com box to what Mike just said. It's like, you're going to have to convert the woman through leadership because every man is a natural leader. Every woman's a natural follower. She might be a, a secular liberal Protestant who's kind of a feminist when you meet her. But if there's the spark there and you're attracted because of polarity, which is this extra element, then just convert her. And she, you can make her a great wife. You can make any of these women great wives if if there's a real sexy draw. If it's a strong magnet draw, you really you feel that sexual electricity. This is another thing conservatives and Christians just don't want to talk about. Nothing in the world like the pull of the human sexy time magnet draw. If it's just if you're attracted to each other, you be really manly, and you can you can convince any Protestant girl to be Catholic or any sex you know counter sexist to become a, a patriarchist woman and this Absolutely. isn't a new idea Th this is what shakespeare's play the taming of the shrew is about that i've mentioned a couple of times before on sea mask so none of the guys want to marry kate because they think that she's too aggressive she's not feminine enough and then petruchio comes back from war and he hears about this hot girl that no one else can tame and he just says straight up i will board her though she chide as loud as thunder when the clouds in autumn crack and they say oh okay fine we'll go and break the ice for you just to make it a bit easier and he just blanks them all and then sees it as a personal challenge to actually tame her and if more guys had that attitude then they'd have more luck in dating forget converting a protestant you can even convert an atheist there's women out there looking for leadership. And if you're just narrowing down, trying to make it as easy for yourself as possible, what is that actually saying about you and your attitude to hardship? The rest of your life is going to be far harder than just trying to get a girl who you've got a bit of sexual chemistry with to actually be interested in your beliefs and what you have to say. That should be the easy bit. Yeah, so well, most men aren't like ready they're... for the, the active role that is being a husband. So these nice guys that they do nothing difficult in their lives. They have these cubicle jobs. Their bodies are just a means of transportation for their heads. Their sweater vest wearing nerds, and they're they're surprised that they can <laughs> add no authority in their marriage. It's like go and choose difficulty, or else difficulty is going to choose you. I hate to sound like Jocko Willink, but it's absolutely true. It's like choose your hard because I can tell you, and the three of us that are married, and, and anybody that's listening that's been married to any, for any extended period of time, it's an active role, and you can feel the 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 spirit of adam seep in you, you know a homer simpson you know he's got that 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 sort of uh that stereotype right the homer simpson husband because it's so easy to be like baby okay then what do you what do you feel like eating like what do you 
and dude, if you're not careful, if you're not on it, if you're not self-aware enough, you're not sharp enough, you become like Adam, you become like Homer Simpson. And so leadership is active duty. And it's, you got to be switched on more than you're switched off. And this is what these guys don't understand. And so yeah, when you go and choose difficult situations outside of life and you're commanding authority in your own life, it's a lot easier when you're with a woman because a woman will break you down and expose your blind spots if you're a weak little bitch. Yeah. And do you know what? It's even funnier. Like, uh, to use Tim and Steph as the example again, I can imagine some guy reading Ask Your Husband, Case for Patriarchy, and, you know, thinking, oh, if only you could move him into Tim's house and within six months, it wouldn't be as it is now. There'd be problems. You can even take on something that's running well. And if you're not up to maintaining it, then it's not going to work out. It's like giving a well-trained dog to someone who's got no leadership presence. Give it a year, it might even get bitten. Mm -hmm. In the... Mike, I agree with your point. I disagree only partly. And that is that hell hath no fury like a woman scorned and basically all women are scorned today and i think it's easier for guys to throw themselves at work or projects than it is to be excellent uh as a man like it's scarier to me what you guys do in marriage is scarier than the stuff that i'm trying to do outside of marriage projects, film, software, whatever it is. They're hard things. They're interesting to me. But like negotiating the waters of romance with somebody who you're afraid to lose, who you care about, you're you're entwined in this way, like that takes real courage. And I think guys don't have the the domains that maybe used to exist to train that like, you know, I spent a lot of time with Tim and he, he tells me how often he would go on dates and just, it was you know multiple girls per week. I never dated a ton, but I bet you, you can't find one in 50 guys who dated as much as Tim was dating in the nineties. I don't know how often you guys dated, but like to me, that's as useful significantly more useful of an ex a set of experiences than like learning HTML or, <laughs> you know, learning how to code. Like who gives a shit if you can't be like a real dude and know how to deal with a shit test, know how to weaponize your chastity, know how to um, have, have courage to talk to a girl and then say no to her and not care if she's going to text you or call you back. Like that's or, the real stuff. Or, or get rejected. Courage. Have her say no to you. Some guys are afraid of that. Of course. Yeah. Of course. I think submitting yourself to God, of course, and being upholding truth at any cost is number one. The other thing is having wise brotherly counsel around you to help call you out, to help, you know, iron sharpens iron, to, so to speak putting yourself through some kind of willing physical hardship and then giving yourself the permission to sometimes get it wrong as a man in your decision-making is where the, the average Catholic Christian man is paralyzed because he's got no experience in any of those arenas. And that's the prescription. Because a lot of these nice guys, they just don't know how to make a decision because they're just paralyzed by getting it wrong or they're paralyzed of rejection. Well, you kind of got to jump in and do it, man. I know I screwed up a lot early on in marriage, but then here I am now I, I was able to endure through it because I gave myself permission to kind of screw it up because I'm like, okay, I want to be this leader, but that means all my decisions. Okay. It all comes down to me. I don't have to make the right decision. Okay. Sushi or pizza, uh, sushi, whatever. You know what I'm saying? Yep. Yeah. Just careers are not vocations as you know, Tim talks about in chapter six of the case for patriarchy. And so it's just the emphasis placed on, trying to excel in a career instead of just be a mensch, you know, be like a, like a, a interesting masculine dude who can deal with all of these things that pertain to women, I think would take a guy further because you can like a guy can do anything and be a great husband. He can be a plumber or he can be CEO of a billion dollar company. It doesn't mm -hmm. matter. It actually doesn't matter. So I feel like getting that out of the way first and just focusing on polarity, focusing on being electric 
is mm-hmm. probably going to take you way further. And then your wife, it doesn't matter. You, you want to be a school teacher? Great. Your wife's going to be there because she's in love with you, not what you're doing. Yeah. Yep. I, I want everyone listening to write down this verse from scripture. It's one of my top ones. For gold and silver are tested in the fire and acceptable men in the furnace of humiliation. Sirach 2.5. And it's that furnace of humiliation that so many guys are terrified of. Marriage will be that for you to begin with. And dating is going to be that for you too. And you just have to accept it because you put yourself through the fire. And then humility is about accepting reality. And I got a message from a guy on Instagram today, actually, who had been a bit triggered by what I'd been saying about how if you're a guy who rates himself an 8 out of 10, but you're not getting interest from eight out of 10 women. And you just keep getting this feedback that they're out of your league. Well, guess what? You're not an eight out of 10. Your rating isn't something that you give yourself. It's what other people give you. And he said, you know, it hurt him. And then he figured out maybe there was something to it and started going on dates with the women who were interested. And he's been getting tons of dates. Whereas before it was none. So now he's just open to the women who are actually interested. He's learning more about it. And he said this, uh, it's increasing the chance to find a good enough match to get married. And I appreciate it. I noticed the problem was my ex with whom I spent four years was gorgeous. It raised my standard a lot when looking to date other women. So he basically got lucky and then was always trying to live up to that before. And now the options are open. So for some guys, it's just about that humiliation and putting the time in and it can be painful to start, but I think it's better in the long run. On the, yeah. go ahead, Tim, go ahead. I just, I know you're really interested in polarity and I'm, I'm reminded of a conversation in stranger things season two on the railroad tracks between the older Steve, Steve Harrington, who's good with the ladies and the one of the eighth grade boys who he takes under his wing, um, Dustin. And <clears throat> Dustin's like, what, what do you do to your hair? The girls love your hair. And Steve goes, it's, it's not about the hair, man. It's all about um, making them think you don't care. But yeah. there's like, again, so much wisdom in, in good, good secular art. This is some of the best secular <laughs> artists. Stranger things is like, it's all about making them think you don't care when you do. Just don't show, you know, be a little stoic. He's saying, and then he's also explaining to him that a, the th- a lesson that a lot of young Christians need, which is it's about sexual chemistry. Um, Dustin's like, okay, okay, so so you know, you make them think you don't care, and they start liking you, and then what? You just move in for the kiss, and he's like, whoa, 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 whoa. He's like, you got to wait for that moment, uh, like a spark. He's like, what's a spark? He's like, sexual electricity. And it's funny because Dustin later in the episode like come, brings that back to to the other middle school boys and he's like explaining it to them. This is what's called polarity. Men and women are attracted to each other for whatever reason. One man is extra more attracted to one woman. And yeah, let's say he's attractive and she's attractive, but a lot. You want to start with that. A lot of young Christians, a lot of young Catholics start out and they're like, I just want to go on a date with the best young Catholic woman who has the most devotionals possible. And you're like, well, are you, is there sexual chemistry? Is there sexual electricity? I don't mean you're having sex. I mean, is there this palpable, almost palpable draw? And they're like, oh, they think that's immoral or something. It's like, you <laughs> girls are followers, man. Girls are followers. They will do where you lead them. I, I, I'm just amazed that even leave aside middle school and high school boys, college guys, I talk to about this and they're like, Oh, I, this is different from what I'm hearing from all these other Catholic trad podcasts. I'm like, well, I know, but those guys don't know what they're talking about. Like we do, we are here on CMAS. We know what we're talking about. Like find a girl that really, you don't have to know why. Yes. She's pretty. Other girls are pretty. Lots of girls, girls are pretty when they're thin, but she's extra pretty to you. And if she finds you extra manly, the draw is going to be incredible. Now you just, you just, fit like this you're the leader she's the follower you you make her into that wife that you want her to be and and guys are like wow whether you're wrong or right or will or mike are wrong or right like 
that's very different from what we're hearing from even other Catholics. I'm like, oh, I know. Well, you should listen to us, not them. Listen to, see, <laughs> to these four guys, not this, the rest this, of them. This is why Tate has the draw that he does, because he's saying things that the churches aren't saying. And right. he makes that exact same point that Tim just did. I don't know if it'll come through my mic. Let me know. If not, I'll just paraphrase it for you. But hopefully this works. You're fucking a girl right, and she loves you. Very soon, all your opinions are hers. Whether it's political, whether it's music, whether what, whatever it is. If you ask her, who's your favorite music artist? She'll say the same artist as you. Or do you like Trump? Well, he, he likes Trump. Yeah, I like Trump. Like, they, they just agree. They, they're biologically designed to fit in to try, right? This is what they're designed to do. Did you look up at, at the end of World War II after all the French lost and the German soldiers occupied Paris? And then here, all the French girls were fucking German soldiers. The, the men who literally killed their husbands, they were sucking their dicks. Why? Because they're the victors. They assimilate themselves in with the dominant force, right? So you're, you're a man who is strong enough to be a more dominating force than society or society program. So everything society tells a woman is negative. They only tell her to do that sex in the shit eat, hot girls sick fucking summer bullshit. They don't you tell her to be a mother anymore. Society used to do exactly that. Be a mother, stay home, be respectful. They flipped it now. Society is now your enemy as a man. Society is your enemy. So you have to out-program society. You have to sit your bitch down every once in a while. They, literally, I'll watch a movie with a woman. Well, I'm sitting there watching a movie with a woman and some faltering takes place. I'll pause the fucking movie. <laughs> See, I'll, 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 I'll say, look at this shit. Would you ever do that? Well, no. Yeah, it's fucking disgusting. Remind her ass. There's someone in her fucking mind. <laughs> Women are programmed. So... Look, we've always said we agree with some stuff he says, not with others. But there's a trenchant similarity between the principle behind all of that. If you strip away the machismo language, which we wouldn't really approve of, he takes it too far. He's saying the same thing as Tim. Yeah, oh, this 100%. polarity thing is seems to be a transcendental, which is why I'm so captivated by it, because it's transcending race. It's transcending her creed, not not your creed, but it's transcending her creed. Uh, it's it's transcending the uh, age. Often times that'll that'll happen as well, and that's the stuff of movies, and that's that's what I think each person can have. It just doesn't. It's not going to look the same for each person. Who your spark is with is going to be. Uh, if you don't believe me, go watch. Love on the spectrum. Tim's been showing me love on the spectrum. And, uh, you know, from the outside looking in, you're like, no, there's no way. Like, you know, cause it's a bunch of like autists getting, <laughs> getting matched. You're like, there's no way, there's no way. But like to, to them from their side, it's electric. They're like, yep, that's my person. Now, now I don't know why that's just, that's my person. Okay, that's because your person. Because they like li lions. They like lions, yeah. They're all very, very autistic. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a very cute show. It, it's hilarious at first, and then you're like, you're rooting for them. But pretty much every one of the six couples that they follow around, the, the main debate topic is ranking like zoo animals, which is hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> Sexual chemistry means the lion makes it to the same ordinal place in your top ten animals. Like, oh, well, he's number three for both of us. We're, we need to get married. That's great. According to love. Like, sorry. No, no it, yeah, it's this... never been easier for men to get dates, in my opinion, um, if you have Oof. the courage to go speak to a woman Oof. in person. Oh, it hasn't okay. been ever easier. Okay, boomer. Okay, boomer. Oh, Tell no, me no, why. I, oh, dude, go, <laughs> I agree. Go and, I agree. Go and speak to a woman in person. Nobody's yeah. talking to women in person. True. Nope. You know nobody's talking that? to women in person i've like stumbled into a girl like gunk in my eyes sweatpants on and take my headphone out be like hey i want to take you out for coffee and they're just like uh uh uh, uh. and i've had friends let's say that are like i'm not the most handsome dude but way less attractive do the same thing and they're they're killing it getting dates i'm not talking about being a degenerate go and talk to a woman ladies if he doesn't watch cabrini and he's a believer just say yes <laughs> and <laughs> and real talk if you're a man and you're a catholic christian don't watch cabrini and just go ask a girl out dude there was a study on that mike recently and it was 45 percent of men age 18 to 25 45 percent 
have wow. never approached a woman in person. Wow, dude. Wow. And even if wow. you get rejected, it's almost like you didn't get rejected because she's she doesn't even know how to even say no. Oh, I've got a boyfriend. I'm so sorry. Like you're gonna leave. You're gonna be totally fine. Stop putting her on a pedestal. It's this. It's in, it's insanity because we're so used to these these retarded apps. Go and speak to a woman in person. You'll shock yourself at how easy it is. Yeah. You're, yeah. You're not you're not allowed to post any more than one negative comment about modern women online uh, for every thousand women you've approached in person. <laughs> in, it's a, yeah. <laughs> so good. Yeah, just go strike out. Just go strike. If you're yeah. if you're a coffee shop, well, I, I told so Nick moved to Hattiesburg and I was like, look, like just go post up at uh, any any eatery near uh, USM. Like you're, yeah, you're yeah, don't up. say which one because it's like right there. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, no, I, I won't. But just post up and just like there is absolutely nothing creepy about a guy just going up to a girl and be like, "Hey, um, do we do you want to sit down and have a cup of coffee right now, or do you want to? We could go to a different coffee shop if that would be like awkward here, but." Like you, you're, you're, can I take you cute. out for coffee? Do you yeah. know how many guys ask Mike do something on courtship? Here's my courtship course. <laughs> Go up to a woman. Here it is. It's just so dumb. I'm so tired of getting this. Oh, what do I do for courtship? Go up to a woman. Yeah. And here's a pro tip: if you want to even like psychologically kind of like bias it in your favor, don't ask her. Tell her, I think you're beautiful. I want to take you out for coffee. Yeah. Hey, exactly. do you want to go out for coffee with me? No, 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 don't none of that dumb shit. I think you're beautiful. I want to take you out for coffee. How does tomorrow, whatever, whatever. And you just lay it out. They don't want to have to think. She's either going to say yes or she's going to say no. More than likely, she's going to say yes. If you're not a total weirdo. There's your courtship course. And yeah. it's free. You heard it here <laughs> yeah. first on C-Mask. Now go do it. Yeah. <laughs> but my, you might get humiliated, Mike. Oh, I know. They might get their feelings hurt. Their fifis might get hurt. Yeah. <laughs> their fifis. Actually, that's what... Uh, Meg, Meg, Megha, we were just talking about her. I posted like a ex red pill testimony and she quote tweeted me and she said she mocked me for sharing my fifis on Twitter. It's okay. I forgive you, Megha. It's okay. <laughs> I, I'm going to push back though because uh, it sounds to me like you guys are saying that uh, men are supposed to go out and, and save these hoes. And that can't be done, right? Like, that's what they Man say. Man up and marry it's, those hoes. <laughs> it can't be done. It's impossible. That's what the red pill say. It's really a black pill. It can't be done. What have you got to say to that? I'm now going to be Rolo for the next five minutes. <laughs> Didn't I message you, Will, something? I, I won't try and scroll and find it. Um, but I just said this past week, like, I think it's like, I think there's a niche opening up in young Catholic guys, like literally going after the hose specifically mm. because hear me out. I understand. But specifically because. For some reason, the hoes have more femininity. They know that they're a woman and they know their role sexually more than the the trad cats. I was like, okay, well, what if we just pick them up, dust them off, send them to confession, and then you lead them? You're wincing, Mike. What do, what do you think? Well, I just think, you know, okay, so Jesus, first of all, can save these hoes. Now, however, if you're a man wanting marriage, you want to stack the odds in your favor, right? Probably not a good idea to go and marry up an ex OnlyFans or ex prostitute or whatever. And so, yeah, as a woman, a, that's a bit like that's a bit too ho. I meant just like you're you're like colloquial ho, not like professional again, right, weapons grade ho. That's a good point. Of <laughs> that's, yeah, that's not like that's so fair. ho that like she has like a 1099 from only fans every year. <laughs> well, I, I guess, I mean, it just depends on how you define, I guess how you define a ho. But I think if every man's got this like dream of marrying a virgin, they, they may be single for the rest of their lives. I, yeah, I'm yeah. definitely more toward that side than the, the weapons yeah. grade ho -dom. You can yeah, look but... at the actual stats on body count and how it correlates with divorce risk. We discussed mm -hmm. this a while back. And you're look, if you're not a virgin guy, first of all, stop demanding a virgin. You don't deserve one. Really? That's one thing we can get out of the way straight away. Mm -hmm. if, if you get one, great, but you don't deserve one. So stop acting mm -hmm. like you're entitled to one. That's a big problem I see a lot of. But 
if we're going to draw the line at where you probably are taking on quite a lot of risk, something like a body count of over three, the stats support pretty well. You're into dangerous territory above three. But if it's a girl who's just slept with one guy and really thought he was going to be the one, but it turns out he was too much of a effeminate pussy footer to actually get married, and then he just walked off, and you're calling her a hoe, then there might be good reasons why you can't actually find anyone. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. there's... You get it gets gets dangerous when trad Catholics talk about girls who had a, a low number of boyfriends and like previous to becoming Catholic, which conversion was your work, trad cat guy. If they were just serial monogamous, to lump them in with like OnlyFans girls is yeah. absurd. Counter more than that, it's counterproductive. Yeah. But I was so back to to answer will's original question um yeah there is this problem the uh the the hq you know the the whole question <laughs> once you get above i don't know for me it's it's a, it's a low threshold amount but it's non-zero once you get above and let's call that number where a girl's just oh that, that's a real problem and she's gonna need um a similar uh, assortative through assortative pairing a, a similar man you know if you're both sitting on a body count of 10 plus double digits plus it's like okay it, you, you know you're gonna you're gonna need that for the girl to get married maybe the guy could pull a girl because they don't it's not a similar priority maybe a, a 10 plus guy could pull a low body count girl i think that happens more often but the point is, yeah, there is a certain certain juncture at which it's just beyond repair. And none of us are so nor was Chase Sovereign Bra ever saying, you know, like, oh, j that's a mischaracterization the way that that Andrew Tate and Rolla Tomasi say, it. oh, like these any guy who's a Christian just says you're going to like pray the hoe away, you know, pray the gay away. That's that's not what we're saying. We're saying something that's unique. If, a you know, if it's a college girl who might not be a virgin but she she was a serial monogamist and has never had a one night stand that's probably the the softer area that that you're in for and it wasn't raised meaningfully christian which most of these girls christian or not were not you know and she's got some non-zero reasonably low number and that's all also this is about preference it's about sexual electricity some of this stuff is just form fit to your temperament then go for them and yes, eventually you're going to teach them to pray and fast. And probably most young guys need to learn to pray and fast better and come into greater communion with the Lord through the sacraments. I mean, I, I needed to even after I got married um, for years. So, uh, you know, as you grow in your walk with Jesus and your walk with Jesus through the Eucharist and confession, then your wife will just follow suit. And that does that is not tantamount to saying that you could just undo the past altogether, the historical effects of concupiscence. If a girl's slept like, you know, three of the entire hockey teams in the NHL, like I, yes, you can approach her and get a date with her. And you come to find out in the course of one, two, three dates that she slept with, you know, an entire division in the NHL. Um, you just let that one, let that one go. Okay. Thanks. That good luck finding someone that wants a girl that slept with four teams in the NHL. So that's what you do. That's the answer. You're dating, you're, you're testing, you're, you're pull testing, you're getting information, you're surveying. Yeah, that's, that's why you have to do it a lot. That's why I did. I was always an advocate of just testing a lot of different temperaments. Some temperaments you think you're going to like, and you do like some temperaments, you know, you're not going to like, and you don't like some though you think you will like, and you don't and vice versa. And you just need that data. It's very, very valuable that to upload it. The problem Crane. too is on, on on the flip side on Twitter you see all these ex promiscuous women, uh, and then the Christians are are you, you you're a new creation and you're new and you're just made new. It's like yeah, um, yes and no. Let's yeah. just like be be real. Like this, it's so weird, man. You know, you get that ex OnlyFans. You know, um, she was on the whatever podcast and she's converted. I'm like, that's great, good for you, amazing. Your physical damage, spiritual damage, like it remains. And that might be a controversial opinion, but that damage remains. Like you're not all of a sudden, you're a born again virgin. That's what gives us the bad rap is we're not calling this out. It's like, hey, listen, 
yeah, listen, you slept with however many guys. Same thing for a dude. I'm speaking to myself because I used to be a degenerate, but I'm not all of a sudden a virgin again. I got to be called yeah. out and say that like it's, you know, you care you could carry that into marriage, right? It's like sexual uh, experience. It's not something you get out of your system. It's something you get into your system. And so to say that now you deserve a virtuous partner, you don't. You just don't. Mike, the, Mike, both both catechisms, Baltimore and the Roman catechism, each express that through baptism and regeneration, which means confession as well, one gets out of the like uh, out of a state of punishment for concupiscence, but not the natural consequences of concupiscence. It's crystal clear. So it's not a controversial opinion. You're right. It, the answer is yes and no, just the way you said it. No, yeah, there you go. It's exactly. Go ahead, Will. No, I was going to say this. Um, Tim will know where it is, but there's uh, Aquinas says that God can't give you back your virginity. He can't change yeah. the past. You can be forgiven for the sin, etc., but you can't change the fact that you lost your virginity. So I think Rollo mischaracterizes the Christian view as saying that you know if you become a Christian again and you're literally born again and you're a virgin again, N no one's saying that. And I'm not advocating for these 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 Catholics to go and marry these women either. You pr you're better off not. And I tell these women plainly too, and it's like well, not enough people are t speaking about it and calling out like disgusting behavior. Um, Andrew Wilson's kind of going semi-viral for calling prostitutes disgusting on on whatever podcast. That guy's so based, it makes me laugh every time. It's like, no, what do you mean? They're not disgusting. It's like, yes, they are disgusting. Anyways, as a, <laughs> as a side tangent, it's like you don't deserve a good husband now. Good. Praise God. Your soul, e eternal salvation, you know, the kingdom, you've inherited it. That's amazing. Stay virtuous now in your new walk. But you're not all of a sudden just going to come get this 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 Christian knight in shining armor that's just going to take care of you now. You don't deserve yeah, it's, that. It's kind of like if you start out the season, in, in, I don't know, any sport. Let's, I'll just do NBA season. It's 82 games long. If you start out 0-41 and, and it's like the worst – season beginning ever it's like a mathematical you know it's it's a it's a vector not a scalar you know let's say you win the next 41 games this every 41 game streak it would be like saying whatever the only fans was saying to andrew i won 41 games in a row doesn't that make us the best team ever no that made you 500 you got back to 41 and 41 this is just a matter of simple math and maybe you make it with a 500 record. Maybe you squeeze into the playoffs. Maybe you don't. But extra deficiency requires extra labor just to be mediocre later. So if you lose 41 games in a row or you get down 41 points in a quarter and you score 41 points in a row, like, oh, doesn't this mean we're the greatest team ever? This might have been the greatest quarter ever played. Well, yeah, but the first three quarters, you you ac accumulated a deficit. Yeah. and. Well Though the comeback stories make the best stories narratively, the tamings of the shrews and the comeback sports ball teams do make the best stories, but they require a metanoia of the characters, a death of self. And I don't know that most women are willing to make that in the case of the OnlyFans girls um, who... They stop shooting porn and then they get a podcast and they dress <laughs> like slightly less whores and then <laughs> just talk. It's like if you if you have truly changed, like I'm I'm glad that you're not performing sex acts for money anymore. Um, have you considered putting on a lot of clothes, removing your access to the internet, and praying until the day that you die? Have you considered doing this? Like that's, that would be the change, the internal change. And then maybe you get your hallmark moment and you're in a coffee shop and some guy meets you and you tell him, yeah, I used to do this. Um, but there's that spark. There's that spark with the guy and he can get over it and you can get over it and you live happily ever after. And it sounds, I don't know if what I'm saying sounds hallmark or Disney. I don't care. I think it's legitimate. Well, the, even if, even if, if you stop, if a girl had been celibate for 10 years and praying for 10 years straight and wearing like too many clothes now 
and hadn't like looked at a guy and somehow had a hallmark moment, Nick, then even if her body count was very high and she's like, I've been praying and fasting for 10 years. And let's say the guy would be able to see she's still pretty. That situation almost never happens. But yeah, that would be different than just I, I'm regenerated through baptism yesterday. I was hoeing around until the day before yesterday. I want to start. I mean, that's 10 years living clean. That is, this is like, it's not just situation A and B. This is situation C, which by the way, probably almost never happens. That would, <laughs> that is drastically better than, than situation B. Mm -hmm. So don't you agree as a single guy? If a girl had been like, yeah, I was, I was a hoe till I was 25, made some horrible mistakes, but from 25 to 35, I like prayed every day and had become saintly. I mean, we're, we're talking about, you know, like one of the saints almost. Then, then that is different. The Andrew Tate doesn't even have the categories for a girl like that. Most of us don't. It happens. The history of the church is full of it. There's no past so degenerate that God can't use it for his glory somehow. If the person is truly willing to put the work in, that's yeah. the bit that is so rare, but the principle that two sinners can marry each other and help each other become saints is basically just a magnified version of what marriage is, because marriage is about the sanctification of the spouses as a sacrament, as a natural institution. It's about procreation. But all we're talking about here is basically this is what marriage does. Like Rachel and I, both sinners, any couple you pick, that's how it's going to work. And slowly you become better together. But that attitude that marriage is about struggle and there's a sense in which you are the cross for your spouse to bear and vice versa. That's the core part of what we're saying that the red pill doesn't like. They don't want it to be that way. They don't want the cross. Yeah. yeah. I'll I'll make two, two final points points and then open season whatever you guys have left to say on this subject we can go as long as you guys want but two final points that i'll make the first is i the setup of situation c tim is a real one and i'll do my best to conceal all identities here i'd be shocked if anyone would ever put this together but i knew a woman who in her early 20s, late teens, early 20s, did engage in a meaningful amount of promiscuity, felt convicted, joined a, a sisterhood of perpetual virginity for several years, began substitute teaching theology, but always dressed incredibly modestly, beautiful woman, always took care of herself. And I think at age 30 ish gets married and it works. It worked. It worked. And that was the only time that I in person, not just online in person witnessed the true change of heart, that, that door C option. And I think that's beautiful. Um, but to my final point, I think if we do our job well with C mask and, this entire debate and trying to push the Overton window. I think what we're going to find is that in the same way that women with abortion, the abortion debate, you know, the, the religious right said you're it's murder. You're murdering a child. And they said, no, it's not, I'm not murdering a child. And say, yes, you are. You're killing human person they're like no it's not and that debate went around and around for years and then they finally went okay okay i don't care if it's killing a person i want to do it because it gives me freedom it's my right to do so i think we're going to see the same thing happen on this subject which we're going to say listen you can larp as a dude you can be a tomboy you can you can get a job you could be aggressive. You could be disagreeable. You can conscientiously object to your husband. That's fine. You can do all those things. You're not going to have romance. True romance. You're not going to have a spark. And I think they're going to say, yes, we can. And that's going to go round and round for just a short period of time until they finally go, damn it, I don't care 
if I have romance or not. I want power. That I'd rather reign in hell than serve in heaven. And this is the original sin of Eve, the original curse. She now wants to rule over her husband. I think we will see that admission. What do you guys say? I hope so. I hope we see it. I mean, because the more honesty in society, the better. And that's that's why I hope all of this, uh, you know, cream floats to the top and that we can get to a point where not everyone's going to agree with us. That's still that's that's not necessarily what's going to happen. Everyone's going to agree with us that that may, you know, the eschaton, all of your right judgments will be vindicated. But before then, which is the juncture we're talking about, all I want is a reckoning remember on tombstone when um your doc holiday is talking to the guys about why and they're like what what does he want want revenge and he says no he wants a reckoning that that's that's me every time i don't, I don't want revenge i don't even want to be vindicated um simplicitaire i just want a reckoning where the cuck conservatives are really who i consider my enemy because that they annoy me more than anybody. I mean, the the radical left, you know, true opponents of Christianity. God's going to deal with them, but the infiltrators into Christianity that have reversed our doctrines—they're the most dangerous people and the most annoying, enraging. But what I want is a reckoning where those cuck conservatives and and fake Christians, feminist Christians, are going to have to admit when they're going to be put to a choice, the, the precise choice that you're talking about. And that's, that's, that day will be as gratifying as the day that we're actually vindicated because then a bunch of the people that are just being beguiled by them will see, Oh, there is no such thing as Christian feminism. These, these are two opposite vying contending forces, counter forces as marked by the first sin ever, which was, feminism adam and eve so that, that that will be a great day in my view i agree with you mike do you think we will see the day when the decision is made open uh that women want egalitarianism not romance no i think i, I think it's it nature is going to be restored at some point we probably have to go through some more pain before we get there I think we're we're now seeing, and, and this is why women in droves are are going viral on TikTok talking about how they were they were they were sold a false bill of goods, and they're really walking those decisions back with tremendous regret. I think there's got to be a bit more pain, but I think we're going to see the pendulum swing really harshly in, in in the other direction. And I think the only way that that's really going to propel that forward is if enough men like us, Catholic Christian men, come forward and are unapologetic in speaking these biblical objective truths and so um and we're going to see patriarchy restored because you know when you think things out to a conclusion feminism always only leads to one place and that's chaos and destruction and deconstruction of the family unit and the hatred of god but that can only go so far until it's just i don't think it's i'm not a doomer in the sense that man it's it's, it's all over no nah, we're so back and we've been so back since the day of the resurrection since days since the day that jesus left an empty tomb we just have to see it all the way through. And having a long-term mindset as well, not just into the future, but into the past, and just understanding that this stuff's never really going away. Juvenile and the other satirists were writing about it in ancient Rome and how the women weren't going to be um, fully into the submissive roles, wanted to act like men, wanted to wrestle, wanted to hunt, all the rest of it. So this is just a fact of life. And guys who don't want to fully face it and accept that, I think it was Plato or Socrates made the point that sometimes philosophy can only clarify disagreements. Stop trying to get resolutions the whole time. You're not going to get everyone to agree with you. All you can do is actually draw the line in the sand. And people aren't going to be won over by reason and logic the whole time because they've got all kinds of other motivators that influence their decision making. Just get that clarification and just say, I know what you are now. Your actions are showing me what you truly believe. And that's okay. That's the reckoning Tim's talking about. And it's not your job to try to bring everyone over the line in the sand. You can't do that. 
God might actually open up their hearts to the point where they're willing to listen. But all the eloquence in the world can't convert someone who's not willing to listen. True. Yeah, that's great. So tomboys, where are we? Resounding L. That's rough. <laughs> oh, <laughs> the, the little the emoji. I agree. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Even the AI is there too. Everybody can shut the hell up about this Hannah chick now. Can we move on to the next gate? The next gate, whatever issue. Seamask <laughs> <laughs> is spoken. Seamask is yeah. spoken. That's it. Yes. Yeah. The issue is closed. Thank you, my intrepid pa patriarchs, for joining me to deconstruct the tomboy question. Tomboy gate. Tomboy gate. Tom gate. Tom gate. Um, if y'all are looking to get married, go to return.us. We just got our second engagement. We're shooting for six. Let's go. Six marriages here, it looks like, on the horizon. Uh, I have news on a, on, a, on a third. Not an engagement, but a significant step in Let's in go. the direction toward a third. We're we're gonna have we're gonna have three or four soon, Nick. But this is like nine months in. Nine months in, all the shit talkers talked shit. All the naysayers said nay. All of the people who who doubt us and and all the negative, feminine, disgusting, passive, aggressive energy online, particularly in the Catholic space. All those people said whatever, and we have better off the charts numbers with a pool of a little over 200 people within nine months we have two engagements nick you and i are going to a wedding in may along with with steph and um you know that i'm sure they'd love for for uh, will and rachel to be out there too i know we would but we're gonna have probably by the year mark who knows three four five engagements everyone can shut the fuck up that's what they can do <laughs> let's go Let's and go. remember, for, for all you guys who love calculators and calculating divorce risks, your homework is to make a spreadsheet for how many comments you've written about women online that are complaining and how many women you've approached in person. And if you haven't got that one to 1,000 ratio, you're not allowed to comment anymore. I think, I think I've got at least 8,000 women. I'm going to go terrorize Hattiesburg, Mississippi. <laughs> <laughs> just high on espressos being like mike pantili said i need to talk to you <laughs> i will talk about i yeah, will the think. end message is don't be a skittle and ask her out bro yeah good advice Cheers. all right guys good to God talk to you thank you so love much. you guys next week god bless take care like subscribe yeah. click the notification bell <laughs>